This is Horror Podcast. Welcome to This Is Horror, a podcast for readers, writers, and creators. I'm your host, Michael David Wilson, and today, alongside Bob Pastorella, we're going to be chatting with Josh Malaman. And this is the first time in three years that we've spoken to Josh Malaman for one of these long-form conversations. And as is always the case, he did not disappoint. So much energy, so much enthusiasm, and what a wide-ranging conversation we have for you today. And it also comes at a time when the This Is Horror journey with a house at the bottom of a lake is winding down, because next month it will no longer be on sale. So if you haven't picked up a copy of A House at the Bottom of a Lake by Josh Malaman, now is the time to do so. It has been hugely successful for us in terms of acclaim and in terms of sales. And it's one of my favorite stories. So if you haven't picked it up, then order it online, get it from your favorite bookstore. But for goodness sake, do experience, do read. A House at the Bottom of a Lake by Josh Malaman. Now, before we get into this fantastic conversation, a quick word from our sponsors. Omnium Gatherum is thrilled to be a sponsor of This Is Horror. We're a Bram Stoker award-winning small press that publishes dark fantasy, science fiction, weird fiction, and horror. Visit our website and explore all the dark delights. Enter the code THISISHORROR with no spaces at checkout for a 20% discount. Beneath Trinity Cemetery, something has escaped. Something not alive. Something not dead. Seven strangers are about to attend a private funeral where no one rests in peace. Night Creepers, you are what they eat. Night Creepers, the new novel by David Irons, available now from Severed Press. Okay, well, with that said, let us not delay. It is time for Josh Malaman on This Is Horror. Josh, welcome back to This Is Horror. Thank you. Hello, guys. So I don't know whether to say it's been a very long time because it's been three years since we had one of these full conversations or to say it's been a very short time because we had a cameo in episode 300 about seven <laughs> days ago. Yeah, No, it still feels to me like it's been too long. That, that that's the, I'm still on that side of the fence. It's yeah. Like, yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. When you wrote me that, God, it made me feel weird. You're like, it's been three years, and and I think I told you in that, um, in the shorter talk we had before, that those last two and a half years have been an absolute blur for me. You know, when when I when I realized that Black Man Wheel had only came out two years and, and a few months ago, it was like, wait a minute, this has been nonstop for like two and two and a half years almost. And so then I guess it makes sense that I haven't talked to you, but. It also, it was a little stunning when you wrote it, when you wrote me that. Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, with so much going on, it's a wonder that you've really been able to talk to anyone in that time. I mean, as you <laughs> say, it's been nonstop. <laughs> yes, I, yes, it really has. And, and you know, at some point, Alice, because when I met Allison, I was probably, I was probably writing like two rough drafts a year, something like that, that, that average. But I didn't have a book deal yet. Um, I hadn't started writing short stories yet, and obviously there was nothing on the film side yet as well. So I was writing like two rough drafts a year, but that, you know, you could, you could, one of those could take one month, one could take, you know, most of the year, whatever it was. 
And at some point, she pointed out to me like, "You're you're doing a lot more now than you than when I met you." And I I was just, what do you mean? I'm still writing like two books a year. She's like, "Yeah, but now you're like rewriting two books a year. Now you're you know all these meetings about the film side. Now now there's short stories and interviews and all." And I was like, "Oh wow, you're right. Yeah, this is different." But to me, the thing that always matters, I'm not trying to sound so noble or something, but the thing that always matters is, are those rough drafts? Are those books you write? So to me, it's like everything surrounding that, whether it was before uh, drinking with friends or, or seeing family or trying to work any job, whatever possible, or now with all these other things happening, it, to me, it seems like the same reality is occurring, which is writing about two books a year. But I understand, and it took Allison like pointing that out to me, for me to like see like, oh shit, dude, you're right. There's a lot more. There's a lot more going on these days. Yeah. Yeah. So it sounds like at the core, at the essence of what you're doing, that has remained the same, putting those two rough drafts out per year. But it's all those surrounding forces and factors that have shifted. Yep. There's a few things like. <sighs> I don't know if they're like holes to watch out for or traps to be careful of, but like, <clears throat> for example, so you start putting books out, right? And you have um, a number of rough drafts that you're, that you're happy with, that you love um, in your office already. So what, what would propel you to write another new book? You know, you know that if you wrote, uh, okay, let's say like I have, like 20 rough drafts in this office, right? If I release two a year, which is, that's not gonna happen. If two came out a year, I wouldn't have to write a new one for 10 years, right? So what compels you, what propels you to, to let's do another new one? Well, for me, there's always been this sense of, I loved how the um, bands in like the 60s would release like an album just about every six months and you got to watch the Who, the Beatles, the Kinks, you got to watch them grow, like actually in pretty much in real time, you got to watch them grow as like artists, as thinkers, as writers, whatever. And I'm really um, afraid of losing that. I'm afraid of like three years going by, not undocumented, but three years going by and turning, turning around and being like, oh dude, you haven't written anything new in three years. Like that is a very, or even one year, that's like a, frightening like I missed like I missed something not and I don't know how to explain it it's not that you know uh it's so important that I that I get my thoughts to the world it's not like that it's something it's something a little more spiritual than that it's more like I need to check in the the whole root of this whole thing is writing right yeah and so you need to like check in with with that root at least twice a year <laughs> yeah well I mean it's like training a muscle or playing a musical instrument and whilst you're not going to forget entirely you will get a little bit rusty if you leave it too long yep 100% that's happened to me before where I'm trying to think oh, I, when I finished my first one first book it was like it was like January it was December of 04 January of 05 and I thought at that time, I was like, I did it. I wrote a book. Now what do we do? Now what do we do? Climb a mountain, right? You know? And six months later or so, I started thinking, oh, wait a minute. Like, let's do another one, right? But getting into it again, I didn't do any writing between those two. And, get, and the second one was Goblin, actually, which now has come out. Um, but getting into Goblin was difficult because... <laughs> And the opening, when I read the rough draft of that one, you could, I could feel it. I'm like, oh my gosh, this guy was like out of writing shape, you know? And then eventually you get into it. And especially that book was like a hundred, the rough draft was like 150,000 words or something. So at some point you're, you're, you're rolling again, but it took a while to get into it. Just like you said, if you stop playing the guitar or piano for months, dude, it's going to hurt when you come back. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Do you, do you ever feel that there is a business pressure on that? In, in other words, like, and, and this is something that we did a lot of, including myself, everyone, we all, we all know that, Hey, you know, a, a, a author, a musician, a actor, a director, they, they don't owe us anything. But at the same time, 
it, when you say that, there's another group of people who are, you know, producers, publishers, and things like that, and they're going, uh, yeah, yeah, you do. <laughs> so do you ever feel that there's any type of, of pressure from the business end that's, you know, where it's, like you said, you could go, hey, you know what? Mm, I, I really want to take some time off, but I can clean up these older things yep. and send them out and take a breather. And I don't think you would do it, but I mean, it's something that probably people have done, For you sure. know? Yeah. And to me, I don't know if it, if, if there's a business pressure on that because you're taking something that you wrote and it may be great, but then again, it might not be great. I know Stephen King has published books that he really didn't want to publish because he had to fulfill a contract. He's, he's been on record saying that it's like, Hey, yeah. I really didn't want this book to come out, but Hey, <laughs> you know, I took a little break, had something going. There you go. That's what you get. Yeah, imagine what imagine what that guy is juggling and what he juggled, right? Oh my God. Um, mm -hmm. But um, yeah, God, it's funny that you say that. The beauty is when the two line up, right? When the business pressure side you're talking mm -hmm. about and, and happens to line up with um, maybe you had maybe I told my editor a new idea, right? And she loves it. Okay, now I'm writing a new one, so I'm satisfying that and also writing it for them to well with a mind to give it to them. So there's those two line up, but when that doesn't happen, like for example, okay, I handed in, I rewrote Mallory in a big way um, a couple months ago, whatever, I handed it in like three weeks ago, whatever, I don't remember the exact numbers, but the, let's say three weeks ago. And then, okay, so what am I gonna do, right? For those three weeks, just wait for the notes, uh, maybe write a short story or two, like maybe take a break, but I don't know, Allison and I just moved into this new house, I'm in this office that I'm all excited about being in, all this stuff. So I'm like, you know what, dude, I'm just gonna write, an, I'm gonna write a new book. Let's just do it. I, I imagined very few notes coming back from, uh, from Mallory. And I'm like, I'm gonna write, a, write this book and hopefully, you no, know, I get like the bulk of it done, whatever, before I get those notes back. Well, here's what happened. I did get the bulk of this rough draft done, but the notes from Mallory are super extensive. I just got them back like two days ago. So that's a moment where I'm like, oh, oh shit. Okay, I have a convergence here. I'm almost done, but not quite like a week away from being done with a brand new, holy cow, a new rough draft. Will this one ever see the light of day? Who knows? Meanwhile, Mallory is the um, you know, follow-up to a, to a book that was on the New York Times bestseller list. Obviously, Mallory means a great deal to me in terms of career, right? And, mm -hmm. and as, as I was telling you guys before, I, I just love writing about her. But the point is, both those books are in completely in the same standing to me. They're both equally important to me. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to finish this rough draft first, take the five, six days to do it, because I'm nervous that if I go to Mallory right now, I may never come back and find the rhythm of this rough draft that's happening right now. But oh, I can I see... Believe. Right. Yeah. Can you imagine spending a month on Mallory and returning and being like, ah, shit, where, yeah. like, what, what was the mm -hmm. beat to this book, man? So I think that that's a great example or answer to your question because I can definitely see someone and maybe even me if I was, uh, you know, 22 years old or something, I could see getting those notes back from Mallory and being like, oh, I, every, stop everything. I have to do this right now. And it's like, well, no, 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 no. Hold on. This, this side of things is equally important to you. Get that thing done. Think about the notes from Mallory. Take that, that week, whatever it is, and then go into Mallory clean, clean headed with the confidence of having written a new book. You thought about the notes. So it, to me, what that is, is I've just gotten better at juggling. Whereas when I was younger, I would have definitely put this one on hold, worked on Mallory, and then <laughs> at the end of Mallory been like, ah, shit, man. Yeah, I don't know. Just write the end. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, I mean, and that's that's a good place to be too. That's where most writers want to be <clears throat> is in that position of you know, like you. Hey, I have to juggle this. I have to make it work. And you you've got enough experience with it that you you see. Hey, that you know, I'm 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 kind of got a line going here. I need to to finish this line, finish yep. this, this draft. Or I'm going to lose it, whereas a younger writer, I could see exactly what you're saying. They're like, oh, I got notes. Time to fix it. 
Yeah. Because that's that's here's the thing. When you when even if you sling an idea to a publisher, especially someone you work with, and they, they tell you, Hey, I want to read that. As a matter of fact, I'm probably going to publish it. That is some wanted pressure because now you're like, oh, well, yep. I'm, I'm kind of almost got the damn contract. I just need to finish it. Right. And so you have an impeditus. That's a different type of pressure than being able to juggle. So, that, man, it's just I always find that kind of fascinating that, you know, um, you have to be you have to be wise enough and experienced enough to to know when to do what you do. It's to me, it's right. like I feel like it's, that I could make a wrong decision at any time and be like, right. "Well, I screwed the pooch on that one." Yeah, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> right. Because we're all practitioners of self doubt. I mean, every pro- probably almost every artist we've ever met or every writer and and everyone we talk about and everyone you interview and, and everyone you met at the killer con and everyone I met at scares the care. We're all, you know, we all know self doubt very well. So mm-hmm. it takes a certain, like you say, like a little, just, just a sprinkle of experience. That's, and then you got to listen to that voice. It's like, dude, finish that rough draft. And also here's something else that's, ex- that is really exciting to me is that, so Ryan is my manager. Um, you know, Ryan Lewis and Ryan and I were like, we're like, you know, practically best friends. He's, he's my age. He's awesome. He's not, again, I don't want you guys to picture some dude in a suit with a cigar at a pool. Right, you know, right. Pictures. Dollar sign swimming pool with a puma next to him. He, um, so Ryan and I have done something that I think is kind of groundbreaking, at least for us, where we shopped a rough draft recently to a company, um, that uh, that would be thrilling as hell to work with, right? A, pro, a movie studio, a production company. So the reason this is a breakthrough for us is because typically, so far, you, you're kind of like, hey, man, the minute it's published, we can, first of all, you know at that point it's been rewritten, right? And you know that it's right. So mm-hmm. then once it's published, whether it's a short story, um, a novella like House of the Bottom of the Lake, um, novel, whatever it is, we know at that point we're good to go. Let's shop it like to the film side. But then, you know, Ryan and I were talking one day and we're like, what, what about just shopping a rough draft? And, and the, and the motivation behind that was typically that initial pitch is what's the right phrase. Like they're going to have a million changes for it. Anyway, whoever you end up working with, they're going to have suggestions, changes, this or that to your I mean, look at bird box, the book to the movie, right? And so mm-hmm. why does that why does that initial draft have to be perfect for them? Why does it have to be publishable? It almost becomes instead like a really detailed pitch um, if you if you know if you want to look at it that way. So here's this book of mine. Um, the editors at Del Rey haven't even seen it. I haven't brought it up to them. Um, it's just in my office. We think it would make a great movie. What do you think? And now Ryan and I are talking in a real way to that company about the possibility of making this movie. Now, if that happens, Ryan and I just opened a door for us because there are 20 novels in here. The, the 20 more, you know what I mean? 23, actually. So right, the, right. Thing, the thing that, that's very liberating in a way, well, in a huge way for me, because it's just, you know, and you, you could serialize, podcast a book. There's a million ways to get a story out there mm-hmm. right now. But that one's that's that one's interesting because you're talking to someone else about a rough draft, and, and making headway, making like like making headway, making progress, and now talking about now I'm working on the outline of what the movie would be, right? And right. I wouldn't be able to have this conversation with them at all had I not written the rough draft in the first place, right? Mm-hmm. So it seems there's something I don't know. It, it's almost like everyone's looking for so much. I don't know, I hate the word content, but everyone's looking for like stories and, you know, all these different channels and outlets. And it mm. seemed, it seemed like I was like strapped to a chair or chained by what had been published when there's all these other stories in the office. And we just, we broke that ice recently. And I don't know, dudes, if something comes of this, that'll be a breakthrough for us. Yes. Yeah. And if you sell the rough draft and it becomes a movie, then I mean, it's going to, doubly serve you because the moment you tell Del Rey well there's this novel and I've sold the movie 
it's going to be pretty easy for them to think, well, of course we want to pick up the novel and we want to publish that. I mean, right. last time we were chatting with you, we spoke about the phenomenal numbers of copies that Bird Box shifted as soon as the movie came out. Now, we know that that was an exceptional case. We know that that is not the norm for every movie deal to then generate that kind of sales with the book, but it's still going to have an impact. Right. Right. Even, even just on the publicity side alone, you know, there's like a sense, I guess, how would you put this? That um, once you accept that, that all these, I think it begins with accepting that um, your book is going to be changed no matter how good it is. Like all of our, a lot of our favorite books, the movies are so different, right? Than the book. So I think it, I think it begins somewhere like in there. When you realize that it's going to be changed, then why not show them the rough draft? All of a sudden your um, uh, self image or whatever, like, you know, you're not as embarrassed to show a rough draft because you know that they would also have a million suggestions about a final one. So what's the difference? And that's that's pretty much the conversation that started. The real weird thing, though, if a movie was made of that book and then you went and rewrote the book, are you kind of doing a novelization of your own book? <laughs> that's deep. <laughs> that, that's the weird thing. There's, 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 I, I foresee this like metaphysical crisis on, on the near horizon if this takes off or if this works for us, where... Mm -hmm. Yeah, because aren't you then, you're obviously going to take into account everything you guys talked about, right? So what is that book in the end there? Is that a novelization of the movie, of a book you wrote before the movie? I mean, that that's that's sort of a mind screw right there. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It reminds me of, uh, of William Peter Blatty and how he sold The Exorcist. He, he got turned down by every publisher out there. And it wasn't until he wrote the script and sold the movie that we got the book. Really? Yeah, he did. He did that first. As a matter of fact, there was actually a little bit more to it than that. He, somebody, he, he had a five, a couple minute slot on, uh, or wanted to be on a, a certain talk show, and couldn't get on it. This is before the book was even published, and uh, couldn't get on the talk show. And he got a call that there were two cancellations on a talk show, but he needed to be there in 15 minutes. And he happened to be in, you know, where they were shooting in New York. And he got there just in the nick of time and got on this talk show and talked about the exorcist. And, and, and basically, you know, he, 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 he didn't spoil it, but he broke the news that, Hey, th there's a script, there's a film being made. And then, he had no problem at all. It was almost pick and choose who, which publisher he wanted to go with. Wow. You know? Okay, wait. So then, man, I wish that he was on this line also. Oh, yeah, I'm not sure <laughs> you guys do. I wish he was that on That would this. be cool. He's dead, but yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah <that's beautiful. laughs> I would love to um, ask him how much of the finished book was informed by what they were talking about doing for the movie. Did they, oh, in other words, did they stick to his script really tightly? Do we know that? Do you know that? Uh, I'm pretty sure that they did. Okay. Uh, I, I mean, obviously I'm sure Fred can had some changes cause he was a control freak. It wasn't like, you know, uh, Polanski when he adapted Rosemary's baby, it was, that was his first American film. He was unaware that he could change the script. And saying he lifted massive passages of dialogue from the book, you know, and I'm pretty sure that Levine, if I'm not mistaken, I think I re Levine actually wrote the script for Rosemary's baby. And so, but it was the way the book's basically the script, you know, yes, uh, because it's I, so dialogue really, heavy and all that. I'm really glad that you're bringing this up. Cause I always like, you know, late night drunkenly talking to my friends. Like I always cite Rosemary's baby as the one where, when, whenever I, whenever, you know, someone's like, this is unfilmable, this scene or that, I always cite Rosemary's Baby. I'm like, dude, like, Polanski did it right. He just stuck exactly to the book, and, and it's the mm -hmm. most brilliant horror movie. I didn't realize that he kind of felt that he needed to or had to. Right, yeah. He felt, he basically, it wasn't that he felt, it's that he didn't know. Yeah. He came wow. in and said, okay, I'm going to have to take this book, and I'm going to have to adapt it. And no one said, hey, you know, you can 
write your own script. You know, we bought the rights to the book, but we can do do it however. And so it's basically he just he was just ignorant of how how they how American rights are different than certain European rights were. And, you know, to me, I mean, you know, of course, Polanski, you know, deserves to be, you know, buried, you know, set in a cell underneath the prison. But at the same time, he made a great film. Um, he was smart enough to make the the real star of the movie New York City. But, you know, um, yeah. It's it's just very very interesting. I mean, another point I want to make too is is we're talking about you know s- selling pitches based upon rough drafts, and I think it's important that our that our readers and listeners understand that when if you're when you're sending in a rough draft, what you're talking about is is something that's actually quite polished <laughs> compared to right. hey yeah I got my rough draft and uh. I've got a couple of things I need to work on, like the second and 15th right, chapter right, right there, right. but I'm going to submit it because they're going to make me add that anyway. No, good point. Like like the, <laughs> the rough drafts we're talking about are, you know, cohesive from beginning to end novels, um, mm-hmm. 300, 400 pages, you know, like a legitimate stab at, um, or, or I'll just put it this way, they're finished, right? Um, right. It's, it's not an outline or or, a, or like a bundle of a uh, jumble of scenes that were like, Hmm, what are we going to do? You know, with all this, no, it's there. It just, it could be a lot better. And the writing itself could be a lot better. And I think that's kind of the side when you, when I at least sit down to rewrite, you know, mm-hmm. after months, I'll look at a rough draft and be like, Oh God, geez, this is so embarrassing, you know? And then, um, to think now of handing that to someone with the intention of them just, seeing the idea inside and and like what where what this could be as a movie it kind of takes right. a little bit of like you know like eh, whatever man i hope you like it it's kind of like if you if you don't take your shirt off at the beach or something it's like taking your shirt off at the beach like all right well here this is me here's the rough draft and i hope that you glean this awesome idea from inside of it um and it looks like in this case so far so good and it's just mm-hmm. That doesn't mean that Ryan and I are now going to send out a fleet of rough drafts or something. Well, maybe I don't know, but <laughs> but, it, but it it is like an interesting breakthrough. I'm, I'm just I hadn't heard of other people doing that, and to have it just it makes the quote unquote you know backlog in this office it makes it doesn't seem so stuck when you look at it that way. Right, right, and you're taking these and basically sending them out to movie basically producers directors things like that you're not sending them out to be published right so that could be the end goal right. uh what they what they have at that point is to them it's not a rough draft of a novel it's just a very long treatment exactly uh, exactly but, and it and it and you have it as hey th- these are novels these are ideas can can could one of these be developed? You you guys want original scripts? Well, here you go. You know. Yeah. Yeah. So that's, that's why you have to look at it. And and, and the, the 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 thought to do this was the result of now having some experience of you know I remember going to um a meeting in L A uh, to pitch like ideas um before Bird Box came out and it was really nerve wracking guys. It was all of a sudden I'm in this room at this awesome company. It was a conference room with, you know, bright fluorescent lights above, you know, that whole thing. And, 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 you know, Ryan and the producer talk a little small talk for a while. And then the producer looks at me, he's like, so what, so what, what ideas do you got? What story ideas? And I was like, uh, <laughs> like, mm-hmm. um, I, 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 um, <laughs> then, like nervously, you know, you know, muttered three or four ideas and he seemed whatever, the conversation was okay. And then when Bird Box came out, um, by then I had seen all the changes that took place to the book and with the script and and in my own life, um, my own writing, the all the different rewrites and this and that and other stuff. And and so by the time Bird Box came out, after that, when I went into a meeting, I realized that I they didn't, I didn't need to tell them every idea or every element of the idea. I just needed to get that, that, the, that root 
you know, like a blindfolded woman ha is navigating a river with two blindfolded children, like a, fleeing a monster they can't look at, you know, like that, like I needed to like distill it down to like this essence thing. And then if they like that, let's riff on top of that. And I didn't, I didn't know that that first time. That first time I was like, well, once upon a time, there was a man. <laughs> <laughs> I can only I can only imagine, and, and, and you're right because they they want you to, they want you to have like one or two sentences, you know. Yeah. And, but you you're in there going, well, see, this thing happens, and these other people they know, but one of them doesn't know about the thing, but this other yes. people does, and he totally. doesn't say anything, and then there's vampires. Right. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and they're like going, oh, okay, yeah, <laughs> yeah, and then um, the way I see it now is when you when you go to pitch um a story to like a film person or even an editor or whatever do it the same way you would do if you were sitting at the bar and you're telling your buddy what your book's about that you're working on that same exactly. you, same exact thing that same oh dude so this is what it's about and then your buddy's like oh that sounds good and you you drink and you talk about other stuff you don't tell them the whole thing you, you give them like three sentence you know tiny little thing that's what you tell your friend that's the same spirit that you should be pitching it to other people. Right. And it's, it's, you know, and you get, you get that, like you, you went to scarce that care and you, you, you have people and you, you're writers and things like that. And I just came out from killer con. So everybody, you know, as much as we shouldn't, we, we do like to talk about things we're, we're, that we're working on, you know? Yeah. Cause it's like, you know, you're like, Hey, what are you, what are you doing? What are you working on now? You know? And, and it's like, well, <laughs> you know, and then, but it, it, the first, it's like the first person you talk to, you may take you a little while. And then, you know, up or after a couple of minutes, they're like, oh, dude, I want to read that. But then you, if you, the next person asks you, you'd say you've already had a little practice, right? So you, you, that's what the point is, is that practice your pitch because you never, never know who you're going to be speaking with, especially right. if you go to a con, especially if you go to, you know, any, any, even if you're not even a production meeting, you know, someone could overhear you saying that. And the next thing you know, they're like, well, Hey, this is my card and I run this and you're going to be going, Oh, Oh, Oh shit. Okay. And then you're like, uh, and they're like, send that to me in an email. And you're like, okay. Yeah. And never know. No, dude, I, I have so much to say about what you're saying right now because th that, that's, and, and Allison really always points this out for me because sometimes I forget to say this, is that um, when with Bird Box, I had been just posting online, you know, oh, I finished a new book today. And then sometimes I'd even say what it was about. This was like on MySpace or something. You know, this is a bit ago. And that led to my friend from high school contacting me and saying, hey, I see that you're constantly like finishing a book, it seems like, every like few months. Like, can I send one to this lawyer friend of, of his, this guy that he had worked with? And I was like, what? You know, that I've told you guys that story, but the point right. is, the point is that all started by like what you're saying. Just don't be ashamed to talk about it. Like you're out with someone. There's always this, Oh, I don't want to, what am I going to tell them about the story I'm working on? What do you think is more interesting than that? The, 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 the baseball game, <laughs> like right. it's okay to talk about what you're working on. And it's okay to like excitedly like, Oh man, I've got this great one about this cardboard woman. You know, it's like, it's okay to, <laughs> it's okay to like do that. <laughs> and, and it feels good even. And, the key, yeah. The key is to not overdo it. It's is to keep it as general as, as, as possible because, you know, there is that you run that risk of I told my story to 15 people over the weekend and now I don't want to write it anymore. Right. Yeah. I, I've you, 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 done, you know, you blew it. So you got to keep everything kind of very, very, very general. And, you know, shoot, and I'm, I know you, you know where I'm coming from. By the end of the weekend, it's like, hey, what are you working on right now? And you can rattle it off in two sentences. And they're like, oh, wow. Yes. Okay. Yeah. And like, you got I, it like, general because you practiced it. You know, it's yeah. weird. Yeah, no, you're right. And, and, and I think that there, it's a certain, it's almost like um, where the confidence for the whole, like, writing um, of the book flowers from is being able to turn to your, you know, your mate, your friend, your 
your family member who's like, oh, well, so what's the new book you're working on? Sometimes people will say to me, they'll be like, um, so what's the new one you're working on? Like, you know, in, in the shortest, you know, you, you just give me like the shortest explanation as if they're almost like saying like, hey, you know, I'm, I'd like to hear what you're working on, but like, I don't want to hear about it for an hour. <laughs> right. right. <laughs> but I do think that that's some, the confidence for the whole thing for me kind of blooms from there because it's like, I told Allison and I felt good about it and it sounded good. And she was like, oh shit, that one sounds good. And all of a sudden now you're, now you've begun the momentum uh, that you're going to need, man, when you're 35, 40, 50,000 words deep and you feel a little out to sea and you know how it ends, but you haven't reached there yet. And that whole thing, you're going to mm-hmm. need that sort of that confidence, that, that um, enthusiasm, like these little tricks that we're talking about right now. Mm-hmm. You do need those because if you don't have it at that 50,000 word mark and you know you've got another 30,000 words to go, yep. you get you start getting thoughts like, I can print this and take it to the beach and burn it. Yeah. And just watch it drift off. I could do that. that would- what, a, what a great story it would be if this was the book I burned. Yeah. 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 And it's like, what happened to the book? I, I got frustrated with it and burned it to ash. Yeah. <laughs> you know? And you don't want to do that. Those those are bad. Those are bad <sighs> thoughts. We we don't want to keep the monster thoughts out. We want to have I'm, pretty happy thoughts. You know. I'm exactly at fifty thousand, by the way, of this stuff that of that. Oh, new, oh no. Yeah. So, and I'm and, and and it's sitting literally. You can hear. Can you hear this? That the paper. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. It is literally sitting next to me on the desk. And so to hear you say that, I looked over and like, no, 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 don't burn. No, 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 I'm not, no, and I'm not going <laughs> to get to the beach. You're going to stay right here. I love you. I love you. <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm sorry, unknown project. And I didn't need to- <laughs> <laughs> we were talking about a different book. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But Bob, you said before that sometimes if you tell too many people, you can lose some of that magic or the impetus mm-hmm. to write the story can right. disappear and... I know exactly what you're talking about there. And I mean, I tend to find that the best way to deal with that is when you're talking about a story, make sure it's something that you're quite near at a minimum, the end of draft one. So you're fully committed. So there's absolutely no reason why you would abandon it. And Mm -hmm. I mean, on a similar note, Josh spoke about telling Alison ideas and for some reason, if I tell my wife, Joe, it doesn't matter how fresh the idea is. I mean, I could have even not written a single word. Telling Joe is an exciting thing. And it just means yep. that rather than lose it, it spurs me on to do more. Exactly. So, I mean, exactly. I think it's good to have a person or some people who rather than it being crippling or stifling, it will actually spur <laughs> you on. And right. to be honest, it's enthusiastic e- yeah. encouragement. Yeah. And even just talking about an idea to Joe, I'll then realize, oh, hang on. No, I could go in this way or I could go in that direction. Or then she'll come up with something that I hadn't even thought of. And so it's literally evolving and growing within that conversation. Mm-hmm. And I, I have people that I bounce ideas off of all the time. And I, you know, like, you know, I have a really, really good friend. And usually this is what happens when I bounce off one of my crazy ideas is I get the, the puzzled look on the face and, and he, and then he looks at me and goes, that's the dumbest thing I've ever heard in my entire life. <laughs> and, 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 and usually I'm like, and that's why I'm going to do it. And then he, and he's, and he's like, and that's why you're going to do it. And you're going to make it not be the dumbest thing I've ever heard in my entire life. And then a couple, maybe a day or two later and everything, you, you know, you run into them again. They're like, hey, that idea, did you tell me? I can't get it out of my head. It's not really that dumb. And sometimes they'll say, especially if this could happen, you're like, well, hold on. Don't, don't, don't throw a monkey wrench in there. But I will consider that. <laughs> you know, it, it, so it's, 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 it's kind of always, to me, I think that because we're so closed in and when we write, it's all about, you know, it's just us and the page. And our imagination, which is internal, but so vast that occasionally we need to have another person to bounce things off of, to almost like brainstorm. 
And if you don't have that kind of little brainstorming network, they don't have necessarily have to be writers. I mean, they have to be people that you 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 kind of have some alignment with. You, if you can brainstorm like that, that that's to me that's how a lot of 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 the things that I do get get you know get done, is because yep. I bounce ideas off of people. And I think it's only natural as being a creative and, you you know, creatives like to share. We have a passion to tell stories. The whole key, key is, is that, yeah, sure, we can sit there and write all these stories and put them on our computer and never set, show them to anyone and have and, and draw some kind of pleasure from that. But the idea is, even though we're writing these stories and you have to read it, the concept is it goes all the way back to the original tradition. If we want, we're just telling a story. That means that other people should hear it and it's when you have that kind of push and pull relationship with your peers the brainstorming that's where some of those great ideas actually come from because you might have the what you think is the greatest thing since sliced bread but because of your limited scope limited experience you're going to have that one friend it's like oh yeah just like they did in this movie and this movie and this book and this book and and you're like going Fuck, where, who wrote all that? <laughs> yeah, I know. Can you write all those names down for me? <laughs> you know? And they're like, sure. Yeah, I'll put it. I'm going to email you a list. There's 400. There you go. <laughs> you know, <laughs> your idea is not that original, but I like it. See what you can do with it. You got to have that kind of bounce. Yeah, I have I have a dude, um, James, who we send each other the smallest, from the smallest idea to the biggest. I, I You know, I'll send like, Man goes camping, uh, pulls tent out of bag, sets up tent, different man steps out of tent, you know, um, mm-hmm. like, like, and then, and then he'll be like, yeah, write it. That's great. That's a good short story, you know, and, and then he'll send me, you know, man receives haunting in the mail, you know, <laughs> mm-hmm. like, great, James, that's great. Write it. And I mean, there must be, my God, there must be like a hundred, 200 each that we've sent each other. And so I will then go through our, it's on Facebook chat, really. Well, I'll just go through our thread mm-hmm. and just keep looking at them like, oh, and then I'll even, you know, you don't just find your own. You actually, you, you tell your buddy too. Like you say, like you tell your buddy, you're like, James, did you write that one about the mail and the, in the, in the, you know, the haunting in the mail? And I'm like, mm-hmm. oh, no, I, yeah, you remember that one? That one's good. You should write that one. Like stuff like that. Yeah. you like, you start to really fuel each other. Yeah. And that's, I mean, it's like what me and Max Booth do. <laughs> that's one of the things we bounce stuff off each other all the time. And usually he's the one who says, that's the dumbest thing I've ever heard. And then he's like, write it. <laughs> yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah. I love that guy. But I mean, you wrote something similar the other day, either on Facebook or Twitter, Josh. It was something along the lines of two men talk in their sleep. Then they realize they're having a conversation with each <laughs> yeah. other. It's like, shit, I don't know what that would look like, but I want you to write it. <laughs> yeah, I'm going to, man. I'm on that one. But then, yeah, that, and that, that is what you just said. That's exactly what I would send to James and what he would send to me. And, that's, and then all you need, all I need, all I need is that one spark at the beginning. Not necessarily someone else saying it was a good idea. Just that one, like, is this one going to fly? Because if you really think about it, even if you were like the most prolific person in the world, what do you like? What would that mean? Like seventy books or something like that? I don't even know. So you're still talking about like something you only do like you know once a year or something. You, you, you see what I mean? Like 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 you get one like that idea, the idea for that book. In other words, the books you write are are like those are sort of like r- rare in terms of like ideas that made it this far. Exactly. At point, you're like, you look down and you're like, oh shit, you made it. Like this, you know, I've had a thousand, I'm looking at that rough draft right now. I've had a thousand ideas between you and the last one, but you made it. You made it. It's like, it's like a sperm making it through or something. Right. Now, yeah. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. It's ideas in, in search of a story. Our job is to take that idea and to help it grow into a story. Because there's tons of ideas out there, man. They're, they're, you know, and that's one of the things that's the beautiful thing about writing and creating is that we we have a ton of ideas. And, I mean, nine times out of ten, we know most of them are stupid. Uh, but, I mean, 
you can you can hear something from someone and not even remember where you heard it from. Oh yeah, but it has spurred an idea, and I, I don't know who said it on a podcast last week, but someone said the phrase, and that would be the king of the rats. And I immediately thought of vampires. And I'm like, oh, wow. Okay, there's there could be something there. And yeah, that's yeah. and that's an idea yeah. in search of a story. I was at um dinner once at my ex-girlfriend's house. Uh God, this was t- my God, this was like 16 years ago or something. Well, I, I think I just finished writing one or two books. So like oh five. Yeah, like 14 years ago, something like that. And and her stepdad, who, whatever, for whatever reason, didn't really like me. I don't know why. Whatever. That was a weird scene, man. But we were at dinner, and the stepdad used the phrase decorum at the deathbed. And I don't know why mm-hmm. he used that. This was like a straight conservative. Like, he owned like a regular little company, you know. And he used the phrase decorum at the deathbed. And I was like, whoa, 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 whoa. Hey, is that yours? And he was like, well, what, do you, what do you mean? I was like, no, no, that, what you just said. You just said de- decorum at the deathbed. And he was like, oh, I was, Josh, I was just talking. And I was like, okay, well, that's mine now. <laughs> <laughs> mm-hmm. And, and, I, and I, wrote, I wrote a novel to it called Decorum at the Deathbed. I just couldn't, the, the title alone was enough for me to like, oh my God, this could be any setting and how someone behaved while someone else was dying. And oh my God, this is so good, you know. Right. Um, and all it took was this guy who I didn't even agree with or really get along that well with which is rare for me in my life and 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 even that dude he said something and i just like plucked it and i was like oh my god and now i got a book a novel out of mm-hmm. it yeah that reminds me of a conversation I, that i had briefly with john skip i'm really observant he was at killer con and i noticed him uh he was uh he had pulled out his laptop and uh like kind of like in you know off off to the side and I said, hey, you about to do some work? And he said, no, 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 I'm just going to look something up. And uh, I said, oh, I thought you were going to do some notes. And he reaches in his back pocket and pulls out a pen and pad. He goes, no, 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 these are notes. And, yeah. he, 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 and he showed me some of them, and they're just like one or two words. Yeah. He goes, he goes, this is what I've gathered over the weekend. And he goes, and I don't know what they are, but he goes, I'm going to, they're, they're notes for something, you know. And he's like, this one here, and he just showed me just some weird word. He goes, that that's a project, man. That's that's a project right there. And so uh, something we all do, we need to have some way to record it. Uh, you know, and I, 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 I'm notorious for, for having folders of shit that I don't know what they are, but I'm going to figure it out. <laughs> yeah, I know what you mean, man. And I'm, John showed me that notebook as well when we were um, – uh, it, uh, where was it? It must've been at SoGaCon. And uh-huh. so John, man, who this, so, so Ryan <laughs> and I are now, we have started, um, we call like we, how do I put this? Everything since Bird Box, everything that's been optioned and, and the like, Ryan and I are now producers on, right? With Bird mm-hmm. Box, we were not, um, obviously there was no way we were going to pull that off, right? Um, mm-hmm. because we, we were completely unknown at the time. So Ryan and I, we call ourselves Spin a Black Yarn. It's the title of a short story collection of mine that has not come out yet. Spin a Black Yarn, like tell a dark tale. And, mm-hmm. and so Spin a Black Yarn has now reached out and we're starting to shop people's um, books that are not mine. So th- now imagine how exciting this is for me. So I come to Ryan and I'm like, dude, so I just read this book by Jonathan Jans. I read this book, um, you know, by John Skip. I read, and then maybe we should look into this one and blah, blah, blah. And then Ryan and I um, have shopped a few of them. Uh, there's like four or five that we're shopping right now. And one of them was a John Skip book. And I don't want to say too much because I don't know what's announceable or what's not, but we are in development with John Skip on one of his books. And John is like working on the script. And the mm-hmm. whole point of bringing this up is this guy is the most collaborative writer I've ever experienced in my entire life. Like when I wrote a uh, script, I've written a few scripts. I wrote one for a house at the bottom of the lake. When I do it, I like, I listen to what everyone has to say, or I just look at the, read the book, whatever I do it on my own. I bring it out. People make notes. Okay. Oh, awesome. Okay. We talk about it. I go back and do it alone. John is like talking to everyone, like every scene, every step of the way, like, Hey, so this is why this guy does this. This is why this. And it's just like, it's so refreshing. It's like, it's like egoless. 
Like there's no, um, John, it's not like John's like, this is my precious vision and I'm going to bring it up. He's like literally talking to everyone involved, like every step of the way. I mean, it's a little overwhelming and it's completely mm -hmm. awesome. Yeah. He, he, he's the collaborative king. And he really is. And the beauty of it is, is that you, 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 you feel as though with collaboration that and me and Michael have done one. And I would say that it's literally, you know, 50, 50. And I, I have a feeling that there's some people who have been burned by collaborations because they're kind of like, well, I did 80, they did 20, you know? So, but he's, he's the one he, he puts in the work. It's, you know, and, it, and, and it's like, and, and, but he, he encourages you and it inspires you to, if you're collaborating with them, you're doing the work too. You can't yeah. help. But to, if I, if he said, yeah. Hey Bob, let's do something together. <laughs> it would be, Hey, well, I like this well, John. And he'd be like, well, I like this too. Hey, we could put that together. Da, 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 da. His energy is un fucking believable. It's unbelievable, dude. I know. Yeah. And I feel like, I feel like I'm high energy. I feel like all three of us are here on this phone. Mm -hmm. um, I can't even imagine, but maybe he's the same or maybe he has more energy, but I can't even imagine Skip when he was like 25. I can't even imagine yeah. what that yeah. you know, was like. Uh, yeah. <laughs> he told us a story about, and I'm not going to repeat it. it it's it, it's it, not that it's not repeatable. It's just that we're talking to you, but he told a story how he broke in. Unbelievable. It's it's basically don't do this. It's oh, one no, of those. Yeah, and it was. I was like, "Wow, that is crazy." Uh, you talk about how when how how the bike messenger service and all that. Exactly. Yeah. No, that dude, man. I he told me that story like the night I met him, and I was like, "Wait, what?" That's like everyone's like dream story. Everyone yeah. wishes their story was that story. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, and it's it was it was amazing, and uh, yeah, he's he's cool as hell, man. I, yep. And you know, he just uh. And he's so he's so laid back when you meet him, you know. You you, you I felt like I had to remind him who I was, but no, he knew. I was like, "Hey, John." He goes, "Hey, Bob, what's happening, man?" Da, 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 da. You know, he's I mean, he's he's on point, man. It's like, man, this 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 guy's yeah. deal, you know? Yeah, he's yeah, I love him, absolutely love him, and I'm working with him in in the, on this on this book of his that he's he's turning into a script. Yeah, it's exciting. So many things I like want to. Like I say something, yeah, and <laughs> yeah. I, I, I feel like it, it, it actually is becoming something of a, um, I don't know the right word. I, I don't want to say like a thorn in my side because it's all so awesome what's happening, but this practice of like you know when you you sign a deal but you can't make the announcement yet, and then like when can you? And you don't know, and maybe even a year goes by, and that side of it is driving me nuts. In this, I like, can only imagine. Oh, in like the immediate gratification, social media world, you just want to like tell everyone right away, we're doing this thing. We we're working with John Skip. Uh, this book of mine might be here. Blah blah blah. All this stuff, and but there's there's this sort of like you know professional silence until told otherwise that you kind of got to abide by, or 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 you kind of may rock what they what the studio has in mind, you know, because maybe they mm -hmm. want to bring. Just they just want to um, target like a certain one director or two directors or something like that. So if you make right. the announcement online, then maybe more people come to them, and then maybe the director doesn't feel like it was so special for them. All those kind of things. And I respect right. all that. I respect all that, but it is driving me a little bananas. <laughs> I think I think they like to build up some type of anticipation without really spilling any of the beans, because there's a art to the reveal. Yep. There's, yep. It's it's timing more than anything. I'm and they have the, people that are behind the scenes that go, "Hey, you can't announce that yet because this is about to be announced." My and reveal for all lose impact. <laughs> What's that? I said all, all my reveals in life are all artless. They're just like vomiting in from excitedly yeah. vomiting information. <laughs> <laughs> no, not our <laughs> too. <laughs> I think this is why we see so many people vague book as it's been termed because people have so many things going on. They're so excited, but they know that they can't say much. So then you just get tweets and Facebook statuses that just say things like got some really good news or working on a new project. Can't tell you anything about it. And you can tell that 
yeah, they're absolutely buzzing and they want to say something, but obviously for legal <laughs> or other reasons, they just can't yet. And yeah, I, <laughs> yeah. I, I think when you said that people are living in this instant gratification world, I mean, that's what it is when we've got so much instantly at our fingertips you almost want to act that way with information so there is yeah. no anticipation you just want to blurt it out there and then yep in, in in all these cases and there's been a number of them and it's very exciting but in each instance of talking about on very carol and other stuff i want to like it's the first question i ask i'm like okay oh, this is amazing we're starting hey when can i announce this <laughs> <laughs> and, yeah. and, and so far really since you know for really since well i guess black mad wheel is in development and that was announced and but since then it's been pretty much like um well not yet we'll tell you when you know and i'm like eh. so but yeah i mean whatever you know nice problem to have i understand that but i mm -hmm. i do find myself you know like i'm just a natural uh blabber mouth right i'd love to, I'd love to be set loose <laughs> yeah mm -hmm. Thank you so much for listening to part one with Josh Malaman. Join us again next time where we will be back with a second and final part of the conversation. And there is a lot to look forward to. We talk about how nobody really knows what the hell they're doing. We talk about a horror story that Josh would like to see made into a movie. We talk about post Bird Box success and how that affects both Josh's publishing strategy and way of approaching writing. And of course, we talk about a lot, lot more. And you could be listening to this episode ahead of the crowd if you were to become our patron at www.patreon.com forward slash this is horror. And another perk of being a patron is that you can submit questions to each and every interviewee. And we have a number of great guests coming up. We're going to be chatting with Mary San Giovanni, Adam Neville, Sarah Pinborough, Lawrence Block, Christopher Golden, and many, many more. So if you like the show, if you'd like to support the show, and you have a dollar, then please pledge to www.patreon.com forward slash this is horror. Okay, before I wrap up, a quick word from our sponsors. Beneath Trinity Cemetery, something has escaped. Something not alive. Something not dead. Seven strangers are about to attend a private funeral where no one rests in peace. Night Creepers. You are what they eat. Night Creepers. The new novel by David Irons. Available now from Severed Press. Omnium Gatherum is thrilled to be a sponsor of This Is Horror. We're a Bram Stoker award-winning small press that publishes dark fantasy, science fiction, weird fiction, and horror. Visit our website and explore all the dark delights. Enter the code THISISHORROR with no spaces at checkout for a 20% discount. As always, I would like to end with a quote, and this is from Katherine Patterson. The wonderful thing about books is that they allow us to enter imaginatively into someone else's life. I'll see you in the next episode for part two with Josh Malaman. But until then, take care of yourselves, be good to one another, read horror, keep on writing, and have a great, great day. This is horror.
Podcast.